Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies and a few days ago I was on a webinar where we were talking about the prospects for uh, neutrality for the Korean Peninsula, more specifically to achieve a reunification of the two Koreas uh, through on the one, on the one part uh, neutrality. Um, I would like to share that with you. Uh, timestamps are attached if you're interested in, only in certain parts. Uh, please enjoy. Welcome to the UPF IAAP webinar series on peace studies. Before I introduce this session to you, I would like to inform the participants that interpretation in French is available. L'interprétation en français est disponible dès à présent en cliquant le globe en bas de votre écran. Let me introduce first myself. My name is Melanie Comagata, and I have the pleasure to be the moderator of this webinar focusing on a neutral Korean peninsula a solution for peace and security in Northeast Asia. The vision of the Universal Peace Federation is that of an interdependent and responsible human family living harmoniously on this planet, sharing prosperity and naturally living according to universal values. IAAP is one of UPF's associations, and it seeks to come up with academic and scientific thoughts and ways to achieve this goal thanks to the cooperation of a worldwide network of academics. The founders themselves were refugees from North Korea, and hence countless seminars and conferences have been convened on that theme. In March this year, I had the opportunity to present my thesis, which focused on a similar topic, taking into consideration the Swiss model of neutrality. And for my research, I also had the chance to use various articles and books and receive the support of experts. And today, I have the great pleasure to thank them as they kindly accepted to be part of the panel, Dr. Van Akim Hansen, who is live from Korea, Dr. Sang Pil Chin, currently in Denmark, and also Dr. Pascal Lota from Japan. And they have deeply studied this topic of neutrality and its application to the Korean Peninsula and will help hence share with us their expertise and experience, which hopefully can be a step towards better understanding the context on the Korean Peninsula and in Northeast Asia to develop long term solutions to the current security issues. The Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia have faced the same security and geopolitical challenges for decades and even centuries. And in the recent years, they have once again been the source of increasing military and political, political tensions that have been felt around the globe. Today, peace activism and research are the more needed to de-escalate the situation. The panelists will explain how neutrality can provide stability for, neutral, for a neutral state and a region, and can be also flexibly adjusted to the needs of the country and, co and the context. Furthermore, the neutralization of the Korean Peninsula, which was attempted on numerous occasions since 1882, will also be presented. Our speakers will do their best to answer these two questions. What steps are needed for neutrality to become a solution to the current stalemate and security issues on the Korean Peninsula and in Northeast Asia? And how could it be formulated realistically and negotiated between concerned parties? Before I introduce the panelists and give them the word, I would like to inform you that the full bios will be sent in the chat. And please also, if you have any questions to the panelists, uh, please send them in the Q&A under Q&A icon, and we will collect them to ask them during the Q&A session. So without further ado, I will introduce the first panelist of this talk, Dr. Sang Pil Chin. He is currently Assistant Professor in Korean Studies at the Department of Cross-Cultural and Regional Studies at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, and he also obtained a PhD in Korean Studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London in the UK. He is also the author of Surviving Imperial Intrigues, Korea's Struggle for Neutrality Amid Empires, 1882 to 1907, which I have myself read and which I very much recommend. So we are very much looking forward to hearing from you, Dr. Sang Pil Jin, and yes, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, thank you very much for Melanie for kind introduction. 
and for inviting me this uh, important uh, event on query neutralization. And I will do my best to offer historical take on uh, neutralization of Koreas uh, from 1882 to 1907. Let me share my slide. Uh, can you see my slides, please? Yes, we can see them. Okay, thank you. So today's talk is entitled Neutralization of Korea, Return of History. And as my title indicates, indicates I believe that despite its past failures, um, now is the time to revisit the prospect of neutralization. And I will explain why in today's talk. So as Berlin has mentioned in my introduction, I have authored this book on neutralization of Korea, which uh, covered from period of 1882 to 1907. And this book is the first comprehensive treatment of Korean neutralization, at least from the Western academia. And in my research, I tried to use multilingual archives from Asia, Europe, and North America. And I argue that my research is still relevant in contemporary times, which I'll discuss later. And from scholarly and from policy makers' perspectives, I believe that this research um, has important implications in the fields of diplomatic history and international relations. So in my book, I seek to answer three key questions. Firstly, what were the internal and external factors that affected Korean neutralization? Secondly, what were the conditions and factors that enabled um, successful neutralization in Europe, such as Switzerland, but why not Korea? And finally, how did Korean neutralization attempts uh, differ from cases in Europe? So to give you some historical context behind Korean neutralization. So late 19th to early 20th century is what historians call the period of new imperialism. So basically during this period, you see unprecedented expansion of colonies, mainly from Europe, but also from other powers, mainly through conquest. At the same time, this period also intertwined with technological advances such as railroads, telegraph lines, etc., and developments. So you could say that this period of new imperialism was kind of like um, the, the, um, the earlier version of globalization that we have had since say late 1990s. So in order to understand um, what were the, the factors that shaped globalization, I would argue that we first need to pay cl close attention on three imperial rivalries. Firstly, there was Sino-Japanese rivalry, which lasted until 1895. And that ended when China, Qing China was defeated in the first Sino-Japanese war, which was from 1894 to 1895. And briefly, from 1885 to 87, we have um, competition between two European powers, that is between Britain and Russia, over the area we now call Greater Eurasia. And at that time, uh, they were engaging what scholars now call so-called um, the Great Game. And basically, Britain uh, considered Russia as a primary threat in its um, hegemony in uh, Eurasia. And I should also note that um, such mindset may have been affected by uh, the famous British scholar, whose, his name was uh, Sir Halfon Mackinder. He was a very famous geographer. And he argued that um, if a continental power at the time was Russia, but I suppose in today's term can be China, ends up dominating the uh, Eurasian continent, then maritime powers like Britain 
uh, would lose its hegemony. So from Britain's perspective then, uh, it had to intervene on Korean Peninsula to um, bring about neutralization, which in turn can um, stop um, imperial expansion from Russia. And the final rivalry is from Russia, between Russia and Japan, which lasted about a decade. And this rivalry ended when Japan um, defeated Russia in the Russo-Japanese War. And throughout this period, uh, unfortunately, Korea remained a uh, minor player. I'm not saying, of course, that Korea did not play any role, but from the eyes of the major stakeholders, such as Britain, Russia, Japan, and etc., Korea was not considered a main player. So, uh, in the history of neutralization, we have numerous cases, but I name specifically Belgium and Switzerland here because these two European countries were discussed most uh, frequently by contemporary Korean and non-Korean policymakers alike at the time. And I should also note that even to this day, when people talk about how can Korea neutralize Switzerland alongside Austria, which I believe Pascal will discuss later, are named as possible successful case studies for Korean neutralization. Now, uh, I also mentioned briefly about Bulgaria, not because it was actually a neutral state, but it was considered a buffer state lying on geopolitically sensitive area, much like the Korean Peninsula, surrounded by major powers. And at that time, Korean um, policymakers like Yu Gil-jun saw Bulgaria as a model for Korean neutralization because much like Joseon Korea at the time, Bulgaria maintained sort of like um, Southern um, tributary relations between uh, itself and the Russian and the, and the Ottoman Empire, whilst also uh, being influenced by Imperial Russia. So you could say that uh, Bulgaria's treatment was similar to Joseon Korea in contemporary time because Joseon Korea maintained its um, tributary relations with Qing China until 1895. But from 1882 and onwards, Joseon Korea also had to deal with uh, relations with Western powers and Japan. So here are the major factors shaping Korean Chinization. I won't go too deep on this, but for example, we have intense agreements such as Anglo-Japanese alliance, uh, role of political factions within Korea, and they were mainly pro-China, Japan, Russia, and Chinization. There was also a concession like railroads, which were important because uh, imperial powers like Britain and France, Germany and others sought to use their um, concessions on peripheral countries or semi-colonies to expand their influence. And Korea was not the, ex was not the exception. Uh, and there are also loans from uh, foreign countries. And finally, telegraph lines and post assistance which were very important because as I described earlier in my talk, this was a period of technological advance and uh, both Korea and major powers used these communication systems to exchange diplomatic messages, including neutralization of Korea. So moving on, in terms of actual neutralization proposals from Korea, so they were suggested quite a number of countries that is eight, and they came from China, Japan, Korea, of course, but also from Britain, France, Germany, Russia, and the United States. So you could see that despite its failure, uh, this attempt to neutralize, neutralize Korea was truly international effort. And interestingly, the first attempt to uh, neutralize Korea actually came from Japan. That is uh, Tokyo, Yokohama, Mainichi Shimbun in September 1882. And um, there were various motives why uh, these proponents suggested Korean neutralization, but mainly they were to challenge China's um, tributary system, to check Russian expansion, whether it's real or not, to buttress Korean independence or territorial integrity of Korea, and to preserve balance of power in the region. Now, among all these proposals, however, 
I should say that in my view, the most important proposal is actually from then British Foreign Secretary Earl of Rosemary. So to give you a brief background, what was happening? So um, Britain occupied this Korean island called Komundo in 1885, and as a way to, um, as a way for exit strategy of Britain, um, Rosemary suggested neutralization in 1886, and I believe that his proposal has best chance to succeed. So why Komundo and Korean neutralization? So um, uh, Rosemary's scheme was, um, of course, primarily to counter Russia's southern expansion. But the reason why I argue that this proposal had good chance to succeed is that um, similar type of proposal was also suggested at the time by Chinese policymaker named uh, Li Hongzhang, who was in charge of China's Korean policy. And although Li Hongzhang did not formally use the word neutralization, he suggested that um, Korea uh, could receive tripartite protection from Britain, China, and Japan. And because joint protection often served as a basis for formal neutralization, I thought that Rosemary's proposal had, if, um, if it was backed up with the clever diplomacy and some patience had good chance to succeed. And Rosemary was not alone. James Bryce, who was a senior um, British Foreign Office uh, official, he, at the parliamentary session in London, he equated Korea's status as Belgium. And of course, Belgium was already neutralized uh, thanks to Britain's support at the London conference in 1830s. So you could see that um, contemporary policymakers approached um, Korea as a Asia or Belgium. So I think it's worthwhile to point out that um, uh, even though the conditions were not exactly the same, at least both Belgium and Korea shared similar geopolitical conditions for neutralization. So what if actually it succeeded? That is Rosemary's proposal. I believe it could have preserved balance of power in East Asia, could have bought more time for chosen Korea for self-strengthening, and who knows, it could have become a Belgium of East Asia. And I should also stress that this attempt to neutralize geopolitically sensitive Asian state like Korea was not an isolated case because in my recent research, I've also discovered that French ambassadors to Britain also suggested neutralization of Siam, that is contemporary Taiwan, I, I'm sorry, uh, Thailand in 1889. So very roughly in the same period, we have uh, another attempt to neutralize um, Asian states as well. And I think it shows how neutralization uh, was indeed part of the mainstream policy discourse. So um, unfortunately, uh, Rosemary's proposal failed, but there were subsequent attempts to neutralize Korea, including um, as a sort of last ditch attempt to make Korea a wartime neutral state to protect itself from the uh, possible ramification of the Russo-Japanese conflict. And interestingly, this was drafted with assistance from French Charles de Fer, uh, Vicomte de Fontenay. And here's the formal statement that was uh, declared. And um, this statement gained uh, support from um, Russia, for instance, because Rush, according to French diplomatic document, Russia thought that um, this wartime neutrality of Korea could protect Korean independence. So uh, at the end of the uh, the Japanese War, there was this um, conference at uh, Portsmouth, and this was held at the U.S. city called Portsmouth, and this was made it by U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt, and the, and the aim was to preserve balance of power in East Asia, so that no major power becomes too dominant in the region. And um, this um, Treaty of Portsmouth sounded a death knell for Korean neutralization because even though Russia still refused to accept that Korea lost its diplomatic sovereignty. Um, by this treaty, it was kind of 
recognized by most um, major powers that that um, Korea had ceded its uh, dip diplomatic sovereignty to Japan. And in 1907, however, um, Korea wanted to make final peace for neutralization and Kojong sent the three envoys and the four to is right here. And their names were Yi sang Yi Jun, and Yi Wi Jung. And unfortunately, they were not even attended, they were not even able to attend the conference because no major power, including that Russia, who actually earlier invited Korea to attend the Hague Peace Conference, uh, enacted Russo Japanese Agreement in 1907. So, couple of months before the actual conference. And basically they both, Russia and Japan agreed that um, Korea was indeed part of the Japan's sphere of influence. So why did Korean neutralization fail? I believe that among other things, there was no major power consensus for Korean neutralization, unlike say Switzerland, which achieved its, its neutralization at the uh, Vienna, Congress of Vienna in 1815. When all the major powers congregated there, agreed that Switzerland will become a permanent neutral state. And of course, as we know, that status has been preserved till now. And unlike, say, Belgium or Switzerland at the time, I think uh, regional security dynamics of East Asia was not favorable for Korean transition. Uh, Korea, unlike Belgium or Switzerland, did not possess um, sufficient self defense capability to protect its neutralization. There is no internal consensus. I mentioned briefly that there are different political factions and that may explain why there was no um, internal consensus for neutralization. And I believed unfortunately that uh, Korean monarch at the time Ko Jung did his best, but I think compared to say Tai King who managed to uh, uh, use more deft diplomacy to protect Thailand from British and French encroachment in its territories, uh, was not able to, I guess, replicate Thailand's success. So I think the decision-making process also matters in neutralization. So yes, neutralization of chosen Korea failed, but why we need to revisit this process? Well, I think that uh, recently, I have observed how uh, not just within Korea, but also outside Korea, there were there have been some calls to make Korean Peninsula, uh, Korean Peninsula uh, neutralized. So, for instance, then Harvard professor, and he was also a diplomat at the Britain's Foreign Office, Roderick McFarquhar, uh, he penned his op-ed in New York Times, and to gain China's support for denuclearized de North Korea, uh, McFarquhar suggested that maybe um, U.S. should suggest uh, permanent neutralization of Korean Peninsula. And in his book, uh, Hence the West Lost It, the former Singaporean diplomat, Kishore Mafani suggested that, um, uh, you know, the way to bring about Korean unification is neutralization. Now, um, before I end my talk, I should also note that uh, as we've seen from last few years, we have now entered this so-called era of Indo-Pacific strategy, where uh, this region has become, according to the 2019 report from Department of Defense in the US, prominent geostrategic construct, and South Korea is part of it. And although the Korean, Korean government, um, especially the Korean government, seems to believe that it should has its bets on uh, US and Japan. I believe that sooner or later, uh, it will have to confront this dilemma whether, it, whether it's really feasible to preserve um, US-centric foreign policy whilst overlooking its equally important ties with China, which still remains the most important economic partner for South Korea. And to conclude my today's talk, I should like, I would like to share some insight from the German Chancellor, Olaf Scholz, who penned a very interesting piece on foreign affairs entitled Global Zeitenwende. Please forgive my terrible German pronunciation, but actually Scholz argued that we are entering a new era where um, he essentially said that um, unipolar world has ended and we're heading towards multipolar world. 
And in this new era, you need a new strategic thinking. So my hope is that perhaps um, Korean policymakers and other policymakers around the world can also embrace this new thinking and that neutralization should be part of that equation. Yeah, thank you for listening and um, I'm happy to take further questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Jean. I'm very much fascinated by all this history. I think it's still very much unknown, even by Koreans, that so many attempts were made, not only by Koreans, but also by international actors. So I think that's very important to know about it. And I cannot wait for the discussion that will entail after uh, all the uh, interventions by also the other speakers. Um, I would like to invite directly our next panelist, Dr. Pascal Lota, who is currently an associate professor at Kyoto University, where he investigates neutrality in international relations and directs the research network neutralitystudies.com. He received his master's and PhD from the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Japan, and also researched and taught at Waseda University and Temple University in Japan. His recent books include Neutral Beyond the Cold and also Notion, Notions of Neutralities. And he also wrote many articles on neutrality for, for example, the Oxford Encyclopedia, Oxford Bibliography. I also welcome all of you to check out and follow his YouTube channel at Neutrality Studies. So please, Dr. Pascal Lota, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Melanie. And uh, thank you to... Uh to the, the Peace Network for the invitation to speak today. So I will share my screen with you and then put this one here on full screen. Um, I am trying to study neutrality in international relations as an abstract uh, concept, uh, but also as a historical fact that we have seen over and over again. And I would like to talk about this to you also about an article that I wrote together with a colleague from Austria, Dr. Heinz Gertner, um, Professor Heinz Gertner. Um, we kind of put out the idea that maybe um, a way forward could be to neutralize North and South Korea separately in order to or in order to advance towards some form of um, security policy uh, convergence that could ultimately lead to uh, the, the the end goal, which would be reunification. I mean, everybody in this in this uh, discussion uh, knows pretty well that the uh, the division of Korea is utterly artificial. Shouldn't be the case, and it is it is as strange and as unnatural as the division between the two Germanies was. Um, it is a relic of the Cold War, but it is a dynamic that outlived the end of the Cold War. So it is it is a it is a conflict between the two Koreas that is that is deeper than just uh, what the Cold War created. And I hope I would uh, I would like to discuss this with you. Um, let's maybe start with why did neutrality not yet become a solution to the Korean Peninsula? Because, you know, what we've just seen from uh, Sang Pil is that uh, something that other authors also wrote about, you know, um, neutralization for Korea is an evergreen. For 140 years, we've had people with the idea that why don't we make this place neutral, right? So, uh, you know, so they don't fight about it. I, either the, the the Chinese and the Japanese or the Japanese and the Russians and, and the British as well. And there were tons of ideas, but it hasn't happened. And the main problem, the main issue for us when we also think about, you know, Vana then um, going to Switzerland and studying uh, Swiss neutrality and we compare all of these neutralities is um, why did it not happen? And on the other hand, though, the realization that the one thing that most authors agree upon is not if a reunited Korea should be neutral, but how to achieve that. It's also something that I've heard here in Japan more than once, that really the only way that anyone uh, here in the security community could imagine a reunified Korea would be if that reunified Korea was neutral. So uh, neutrality is probably one going to be one of the linchpins under the uh, expectation that 
nothing else changes. Let's suppose that the North Korean uh, regime remains in place, that the South Korean democracy remains in place the way they are. China remains where it is and as powerful as it is, the US remains in place. If all of the, the other circumstances remain the same, the only rational way to expect that we could somehow get a reunification would be if the Korean in, if Korea was neutral in some sense, and that would then have to be only one um, aspect. There would be certainly other issues that need to be would need to be resolved. For instance, um, how to how to reunite two two systems that are so inherently different political systems, right? A federal structure, uh, maybe a an, an European Union kind of structure of like two sovereign states inside uh, one one union, something like that. But uh, and certainly then also the um, uh, the question of what happens to the nuclear weapons the North possesses. So there is a lot of things, a lot of boxes that need to be ticked off, and a lot of p um, puzzle pieces that would have to come together. But one of these puzzle pieces would definitely be the question of where or uh, reunify korea belongs to in uh, geopolitical terms right security terms uh, on whose side is it going to be on because right now we have a situation where the north is very much a buffer serving as a buff buffer state for um for china uh, so that the U.S. troops are not right next to its borders, and uh, and South Korea serves to the United States as an extension of its military power into uh, the Asia Pacific region. So, um, with this in mind, we can maybe just very briefly um, conclude. You know, the the, re the very simple reason why we don't have a neutral Korea as yet yet is just because the circumstances, the real political circumstances were never such that allowed for this. This is kind of a very disappoint disappointing answer. It's just like, you know, politically, it, we never had all pieces, all necessary pieces come together at the same time. Now, for a neutralization to actually work, you need this little bit of luck when 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 different circumstances come together. And we can see that again and again when we go through history. I'll talk about this now for um let's, let's see this. Just so that we um, that we talk about the same thing. When I when I talk about realpolitik and realism, what I mean is um an um an approach to look at politics that happens on the ground. Um, in the way, in 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 a realistic sense, in, in leave let's leave ideology aside and let's leave our best wishes aside. Let's look at who has power and who would want to stay in power, and let's recognize that there is no higher authority than the power of states. We have a United Nations, that's true. We have international law, that is true. But at the end of the day, it is the states themselves that are the most powerful actors in international relations still, and that's the same today as it was in the nineteenth century. Um, which is not to negate the, the importance of international law, but uh, Kim Jong-un in the north calls the shots at the moment, and it is the South Korean uh, uh, government that calls the shots for South Korea, and the, these actors influence others, right? I mean, we've just seen how the South Korean uh, Koreans like negotiated with the Americans about, about nuclear weapons and actually got like very important concessions from them, and that's because because states can, because they are the the top level uh, decision makers the international world is uh, is a, in a const is still in a constant state of anarchy and there is um coordination among the states but states are what we need to focus our attention on international politics is still about power and national interests states try to maximize the power and security states try to avoid being ruled over by others and states uh, try to realize the national interests interests which can be pure pure self-interest but usually go above that right you have other interests you have ideological interests you have you have uh, reputational interest. So this is all quite uh, qu quite complex, and this is something we also need to uh, figure in when we when we discuss neutralization that the that the connections between the different actors who hold power right are complex, and not everybody has the same vision right within South Korea, within our group, within in Japan, in the United States, you have you have you have opposing groups that would would want to see one outcome rather than the other. And all of these um, all of these uh, um, political um, interactions, they then create the reality that we in the end see. 
Now, the, my claim is that if the moment is right and enough puzzle pieces come together, then uh, a, a neutral and reunified Korea could happen. And so at the heart of, the, of realism is the recognition of what one can do and what one can't do. And discussing this topic, we should try to analyze what is possible on the ground at the moment, what is not, what is uh, an idea we have, and what ca could be achieved with which kind of um, methods. So what is what are the realities in Korea today? North Korea is uh, used to be a client of the um, USSR, of the Soviet Union, but today is more or less a client of, um, of China, at least a buffer state serving as a buffer to China. Um, to keep the Americans away. It is, an, it is also an independent actor. That's very Im important. I mean, the North Koreans again and again have shown their will to defy uh, not only the Americans, but also the Chinese, also when it comes to like developing their own nuclear weapons, right? And they have, uh, they have succeeded in, in, uh, in doing so. They've also succeeded in meeting with the president uh, of the US back in 2017. I mean, again and again, the North has has had its own will and has had its its way of, of doing international relations. Um, it is, though, still a military dictatorship, um, and we don't know how stable it is. Uh, we don't, I mean, Kim, Mr. Kim Jong-un had to kill his uncle and his brother, which is usually not a good sign for the stability of a, of a dictatorship if you have to start killing off your own family. But um, let's suppose that this regime remains in place for the next, for the next uh, decades or so, and then start reasoning from there. South Korea is a client uh, to the U.S. military empire um, and the hubs and spoke system that the U.S. created um, in the Pacific Alliance system, right? Um, so South Korea, just like Japan, act as very important places for the Americans to project their power, and especially against China. Um, it's a multi-party parliamentary democracy, potentially unstable. We have seen unrest inside South Korea as well over the last couple of um, deca uh, decades. Um, especially presidents are um, either die or end up in prison very, very frequently. Um, it's also an independent actor with, with a large army, but without nuclear weapons of its own. And now we've seen this sharing agreement, probably then changing also the nuclear calculus a little bit. So the realism in neutralization then is um, the, this idea that there are, that, I, that neutralizations can be successful um, when all the actors involved, all main stakeholders, have something to gain. And by the way, when I say neutralization, what I mean is a um, an agreement that is made um, through a treaty with other actors together that this place should be neutral, which is different from a neutrality like the neutrality of Finland or Sweden, where, where we never had an international agreement where other actors said you should be neutral. But Finland and Sweden said, oh, we're going to be neutral out of our own will. And we, we have a neutral foreign policy. But for real neutralized countries like Switzerland, Austria or Turkmenistan at the moment, um, there is a there's some form of agreement either at the United Nations or um, multilateral uh, treaties where where these parties kind of write down that okay um, this is uh, we agree that this place should be neutral right and something like that is what we would have to aspire to for uh, for Korea because we have seen over the last 140 years how every attempt at neutralization failed just because we didn't get an agreement and I mean one or several parties were against it and then tried to grab. Um, as much of um, of Korea as they could, either directly or indirectly. Um, neutralizations fail when one of the key players thinks that confrontation or war is the better option than going for neutralization. And we have seen examples of that as well. And it's very important that we study the negative examples as carefully as the positive ones. The positive ones, Switzerland 1815, Austria 1955, Turkmenistan 1995 positive examples. Negative examples, Germany in 1955, there was a real chance for a reunified uh, neutral Germany in 55. Didn't happen because Adenauer, Chancellor Adenauer was sternly against it, but there was a very good chance for it. Hungary in 1956 tried to become neutral, but then was invaded by, the, by its uh, Warsaw Pact uh, members and uh, never happened. Laos and Cambodia, there was an agreement for their neutralization and then it collapsed, completely collapsed and they become, became part of the Vietnam War and especially uh, Cambodia suffered horribly. And Ukraine was neutral until 2014 and uh, even in 2022, 
what Russia demanded was a neutral Ukraine, and it never happened, and Ukraine still has war today, because one or several actors decided that probably we can get out more. We can get more with a war than with a neutralization. So this is important to keep in mind. So if it happens again that um, Korea is pushed to the brink, um, what we need to hope or work towards is that all actors agree that probably a neutral Korea is better than another war in Korea. Um, good news, though, is that the uh, neutralization does not depend on um, on uh, the, the the regime type. Um, we have examples like Switzerland and Austria, which are democracies and neutral, and we have examples like Turkmenistan, which on the Freedom House Index is actually one rank below North Korea, that is also recognized as permanently neutral. So we can we could imagine a dictatorial permanent neutral North Korea. That is not out of that's not something that we have never seen before. And neutralizations can outlive their initial purpose, which is, you know, the Swiss case of 1815 is very different from Switzerland today. Uh, uh, but the, new, the neutral, neutrality policy continued, even though the geopolitical circumstances have changed. So that might also give us some hope that once in, installed, once in place, maybe that neutralization could then uh, lead to um, permanent or constant uh, uh, um, pacification of the Korean Peninsula. Um, North-South neutralization for reunification is really the only imaginable scenario at this at this point in order to re reunite them. So it's either permanent neutrality or permanent division. Um, pretty much also what it is going to be for uh, for Ukraine. Uh, one of the few policies that some actors in North and South can actually agree on. We have examples of Kim um, Kim Il Sung actually um, writing a letter to Ronald Reagan and saying, "Hey, um, the, the Korean Peninsula should be should be neutralized." And we have example of South Korean politicians who um, officially think uh, thought about um, how how about a neutral framework for the for the Korean Peninsula. So this is actually a point where discussion could happen, and I do hope that Ivana and and others in in her network will will achieve like further discussions in the North and the South about, you know, maybe something that the two states could agree on, or at least certain parts of, uh, of the population. And it might be started by Pyongyang and or by Seoul on their own. That's also important. You know, although China and the United States are very, very important in this equation, Seoul and Pyongyang both could start a process towards, um, towards uh, a neutralization of the um, uh, of the peninsula. That's the article that I wrote with the idea of like maybe a dual approach um, uh, the North trying to adjust its security relationship with China and the South its security relationship with the United States um, to basically um, start, uh, start working on the groundwork to create security compat uh, compatibility um, between the two with the basic idea that um, the model of Finland could be quite instructive for North Korea of how its current security relations with China could be transformed, because at the moment there is a, security, a hard security treaty in effect between the DPRK and the PRC. Um, and if that could be changed to a unidirectional uh, security treaty where North Korea promises we will defend, uh, we will defend our territory, um, if any kind of uh, hostile power should try to attack China through our territory, um, then this would already be a first step towards an, um, being compatible with a, with a neutral framework. And that would be exactly what Finland promised to the Soviet Union um, it's, to, uh, to, to, to secure its northern flank. Um, the most important thing for North Korea is that it has to keep China happy because China is also its one like it, it's still uh, the its economic last economic lifeline, right? So um, China's happiness is very very important to must be very important to North to North to the North Korean regime. On the other hand, we could imagine uh, an Austrianization. Uh, for South Korea, and I'm um, um, Melanie. You were studying, of course, the Swiss example for um, for Korea. My argument is a bit that Austria is actually a better example, at least in terms of the um, uh, well of, of, of the of the historical parallel between the two. That you could transform the um, South Korean U.S. Security Treaty of Mutual Defense into a unilateral security agreement. 
um, and 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 kind of change the modality. Something that we actually have seen recently with again with the uh, the, the uh, nuclear sharing agreement, although that's kind of uh, going in a in a different direction. But we have seen how South Korea is able to change its uh, security relationship. The most important thing here is that South Korea must keep the United States happy. Um, because the it's it's um, for the nuclear deterrence and for secure for security deterrence against against the North at least at the moment the U.S. is the backbone of of Korean security and and, and security thinking. So you cannot alienate um, your most important partner too much. So the the challenge for a realistic approach towards neutralization is how to step by step work towards becoming neutral without without angering your very most important security partners right um so the strategy would have to be to create a security policy com uh, security policy compatibility between north and south korea for future reunification in order to have something already in place without rocking the boat too much in either of the two states and this is very difficult i mean this is not a there is no straightforward kind of silver bullet to actually do this but since we are here in a in a in an environment that wants to think about this and that wants to uh, create these these ideas, I would like to remind you of what Seneca said, and that is, luck is when pre preparation meets opportunity. So why not keep all of these strategies, keep all of these ideas, and try to work with the partners we can work with, and figure out what would have to be done in order to achieve. This thing that we have been, uh, that we are now the latest version of 140 year history of trying to use this tool of great power politics to bring peace to, an, uh, to the Korean peninsula. And maybe we just hope that at the right time, all of the pieces come together and we bring our peace and we, uh, we try to, we try our best to say like, this is as much as we could do. Um, I am, uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lota, for your expertise. I really feel so enriched by your words and all your knowledge. I think it's going to be a very good discussion. <laughs> um, I will directly go on with our last speaker, uh, Dr. Van Akim, who was also a great support for the completion of my thesis, but also for the org organization of this webinar. So I would like to thank her deeply for that. Dr. Van Akim Hansen is a co-chair of the Council for the Neutralization of the Korean Peninsula and is also the, the coordinator of the International Network for Neutral Korea. She holds a PhD in education from Harvard and has been on a mission to create peace and love around the world for over five decades. She also co-organized in 2015 the Women Cross DMZ that led 30 international women peace activists to march in Pyongyang and Kaesong side by side with thousands of North Korean women. Please, Van Akim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, <laughs> Melanie, and um, the members of UPF. Um, my topic is um, Path to Peace in the Korean Peninsula. And uh, this is about a rising wave of international neutrality activism. So um, I would like to first talk about who are we? We are composed of three groups. One, neutrality activists based in Korea. Two, overseas Korean neutrality activists. Three, international neutrality supporters. In the first category of neutrality activists based in Korea um, have two components. Ones that are uh, in South Korea or were in South Korea and the ones who were in North Korea, who uh, all of them that I would call neutrality activists in North Korea um, from uh, South Korea, who went to North Korea. And um, my grandfather, Yu Jong Man, is one of them. And there are um, four um, such neutrality activists who went to North Korea from South Korea um, that I know of. And uh, um, three of them were um, labeled 
um, counter revolutionaries in the uh, Kim Il Sung um, period, and they were condemned. Most likely, they were sentenced to death. And um, the the one that the the biggest figure, Cho So Wang, he died um, broken heart and um, in in sickness because of uh, the three were um, killed. My father and Cho So Wang were close associates. I have pictures of them, but uh, uh, it's because it's part of a, a large album, I was unable, I'm not very good with, um, uh, with the technical stuff. So I couldn't cut it out to just post that photo. Um, so my grandfather, Lee Jong-man, who went to North Korea in 1948, when he saw South Korea was going, um, was aligning with North uh, US and he um, uh, foresaw that that's not the right direction for Korea. And uh, so he went to North Korea in 1948. And uh, he, at that time, um, or soon after that, uh, Cho So Wang um, went to North Korea. So they were um, living there um, in the same period. And um, my grandfather, uh, he kept silent. He kept the permanent neutrality in his heart, didn't speak out about it. And until when he met my mother, his youngest daughter, who came to visit in 1975, and they were um, reunited. They were um, divided families. We, we were divided families, uh, immigrated to um, first to Brazil and then to Canada and uh, and then to uh, I went to, came to U.S. Um, so my grandfather was um, um, a, the key figure who um, caused this thing happening um, uh, in South Korean overseas uh, um, among the overseas Koreans and now going to Switzerland and all all of that because he create this dispersion among our family to move out of Korea. He went to North Korea. And then um, my sister is in Montreal, Canada. My brother, one brother is in um, Adelaide, Australia, and I'm in LA, and my other brother is in Korea. Um, and all of us are um, neutrality activists in heart. And uh, now uh, in, for mostly we are spiritual activists which um, pretty much um, go together um, in the sense that we are, are um, um, so I'll go to the next um, um, item. What is our common denominator? There are three points that I made. We are connected at the highest level of consciousness by the force of spirit of peace and harmony. And this, when I heard um, the uh, the famous uh, mediator, Dr. Um, Kenneth Clark, he called it uh, the higher order of democracy, uh, interest-based democracy. It's pretty much the same thing that I am thinking of. Um, so everyone that I'm closely associated with have the same thing in common, that we are connected at the highest level of consciousness by the force of spirit of peace and harmony. The second is we practice permanent neutrality at the individual level by conducting conflict resolution in all areas of our personal living. Uh, I haven't met anybody uh, in my neutrality activism who are sincerely that, um, who do not practice conflict resolution in their daily living, especially with the families <laughs> where the, the uh, conflicts can come really um, delicately, but severely. Um, so that's a very important um, way to notice if this person is a truly um, a practicing um, neutrality activist. This is my own slant. Um, um, 
getting into um, neutrality activism and uh, in, with this kind of angle, a spiritual, a psycho-spiritual perspective, I can reach average Koreans, especially women, mm, that normally the, the neutrality um, movement or the, the power struggles, the, the, um, the political um, um, ways of doing things don't touch, don't reach. But in, in the situation like South Korea, um, where the people power is very strong. And the reason I, I think is uh, very much because the South Korean people are fundamentally and essentially uh, spiritually oriented people. So um, they can be very patient and they let things happen, let the, the power mongers pursue that they're, what they're interested in for self-interest. But there comes a point when they said, no more. We had enough of that. And so uh, we don't let the bug pass this point. Um, I think that is a very important point about South Korean um, people and uh, entry point to um, neutrality movement, mobilizing neutralization. Um, uh, I heard um, Dr. Jin saying that Korean neutrality, uh, one of the reasons why Korean neutralization failed is because of the, inter the lack of internal consensus for neutrality. And uh, um, the way to build consensus, internal consensus for neutrality in Korea is through um, reaching the hearts of the people, the spirit of people who are very heaven oriented. They have a, such a strong sense of justice that if you don't meet them there, or if you meet them there, you um, start talking. Um, what I was going to say is that one thing that um, I found that we can do is um, uh, um, make the neutrality. So I'm going to wait for the following point. The, the, the number three in the um, our common denominator is we are calling for the South Korean people's attention to choose the path to peace through neutrality and to hold hands with international supporters. And we aim to foster peace and sustainability across the Korean Peninsula and the world. It's a high order thing, but uh, this, to me, this is um, what's open, what we can do and other things um, we cannot do. So this is the path that um, uh, we chose and um, uh, the, uh, um, the wave is um, rising. Next question is when? So um, it's right now, right now is the time as South and North Korea and other nations worldwide are under tremendous pressure. The US and China are clashing. North Korea with the nuclear power is pushed to their last limits and the world fear a possible nuclear war. Where do we start? We, the Korean neutrality activists, are venturing to invite the international community to unite, to build the atmosphere for permanent peace in the Korean Peninsula by voicing their concerns and support. How can we start this? Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. I guess that was the conclusion. I'm not sure if you're still on or if we have again a technical issue, but I suggest we directly go on with the discussion. I yes, I suggest you have the floor, the four, the three of you to um, just comment on each other's presentation, but also to go further into answering the two main questions of the webinar, which were uh, mainly specific steps to take on for neutrality to become a possible solution to the stalemate and security issues, but also how perhaps it could be realistically applied. We've spoken a lot about 
puzzle pieces being put together, as Dr. Lota mentioned, or also the, how the current situation could perhaps be ripe for neutrality. Um, yes, I suggest we further discuss about these points. May I maybe start because uh, there's there's two very interesting questions by um, Gurun Hassinin. And um, the first the first question I see is like, how could um, a neutrality be guaranteed that like superpowers around uh, Korea would respect it uh, if that ever happened? And the answer to that one is probably the same as with all the other neutralizations. Part of it needs to be the preparation from Korea or the Koreas. You know, you need to be def to be able to defend your neutrality to a good extent. I mean, um, all of the successful permanent neutrality we, we have seen are armed. Switzerland, Austria, and also Turkmenistan, they, they keep armies. So keep an army. And, you know, the Koreas at the moment, they are highly, they are well, very, very well equipped uh, for very obvious reasons, the North, even with nuclear powers. If actually the two Koreas came together, if somehow there was a framework, uh, Korea would be quite a superpower, the, a, a unified Korea on the peninsula, you know, um, maybe not quite on par, but close to let's say uh, uh china definitely definitely we would have more military capability than let's say japan um so that that is that is something the other thing is you know um neutrality is never a guarantee that nothing happens to you it is only a, a is an approach but so is so are the other approaches right being in an alliance be uh, South Korea being in an alliance with the US and North Korea being in an alliance with the Soviet Union did not keep the two from having a three-year war killing several million people, right? An alliance is not a guarantee. An alliance can be on the opposite. It can push you towards war. And that's something that the Koreas still today need to be very, very careful about. That's why a superpower confrontation cannot be in the interest of neither of the Koreas. And the second question, the... Um, uh, might it be possible to have a nuclear and neutral Korea? Um, it would maybe be possible, but this would be a very, very difficult sell to Japan and also to China. Probably even the Chinese wouldn't want to see uh, a nuclear reunified independent Korea. It's a very different thing to have a, new, a nuclear a North Korea that is more or less very much dependent on you or having a reunified one with its own nukes. So probably, probably if this ever came together, we would uh, the the question of denuclearization of North Korea would would just as much flow into the discussion or have to flow into any kind of agreement, uh, which will, won't make it any easier. But um, I doubt that the superpowers China, the US, and Russia would sign off on a nuclear a neutral Kore uh, Korean Peninsula. Uh, could I also chip in? Uh, so. Thank you very much, Pascal. Actually, I have a. I'm currently reading your article on uh, dual neutrality for Koreas, and I have to say that as an eternal pessimist, that even though I'm pushing for neutralization, I feel most of the time that is my research actually worthwhile. You know, is it really? I mean, there's even any chance. But then after reading your article and listening to your presentation, I feel like yeah, maybe Austria's scenario can be a good one. But I think the challenge is that you mentioned that utilization can come from within Korea. I think realistically, I don't know about North Korea, but in South Korea, it's, it's immensely difficult. So perhaps then, would you say that it's better to look to foreign you know, proponents? For example, you know, let's say, like I mentioned Kishore Makhvani, you know, he, he and but then I think he unfortunately he passed away. But if he can convince the likes of, you know, something so, someone in the U.S. or in Japan that who have certain voices in policy making, maybe then South Korean elites can also be swayed by it. Because as it now, and I'm afraid in the decade also at least, I'll be very surprised if someone from South Korean ruling class and says, well, looks like neutralization is the only way forward. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah. yeah, and you know, we have this problem that neutrali neutrality neutralization is very easy to demonize. It's very easy to say, 
neutrality for Korea, it's a ploy. It's, it's a North Korean ploy uh, to, to, to grab the entire peninsula. We must oppose it. That's what happened to Ukraine. And that's what happened to Germany. Adenauer said, it's a Russian ploy. The Russians don't mean it. The Soviets just want to uh, make everything, everybody communist. And then it never happened. So it's very easy to kind of say neutrality is the other, is not, you know, if you're not with us, you're against us. And the neutrals by that definition are always on the other side, right? So, um, the only realistic chance I see for this to come together is if the United States starts withdrawing from the Pacific. If that happened and they wanted to take troops out, then there would be a window of opportunity uh, in order to, to forestall a power vacuum and basically push South Korea to, to uh, kind of agree to some form of, um, of, of great bargain with the North. Um, it's hard to imagine, but so as long as that doesn't happen, this withdrawal um, of the U.S. from the Pacific, I also don't, I, I think for the U.S. it's much more, e much easier and much more straightforward to just continuously push for more and more troops in South Korea and for a closer and closer security alliance, um, because that's, that's, I mean, it's already there. I mean, the system is there. So we are thinking about a change that would um, change a running system, which is difficult. But again, I think what we can do on the ground is at least put out the intellectual backbone to say, like, this is, this is the case, this is what could be done. Um, and maybe the North, maybe the North could start pushing for it, which would, of course, give the, the people uh, in the South and in the US a lot of ammunition to say, like, it's a ploy. But, you know, <laughs> somebody, somebody could start. And, and Kim, Kim, Jong, uh, Kim, Kim Il-sung did. Kim Il-sung proposed it to Reagan. It's the I think in the north it might have um, political momentum because it would look like um, more support for them or could get, give them more support on the world stage. What I found particularly interesting in Dr. Jin's book is also the input of certain states that didn't have such um, so as much interest in the Korean Peninsula as other powers. So for example, France or Germany, they were they also somehow suggested the neutralization. So I wonder in that case, how in today's context, do, would we need also certain neutral states to support that process instead of the US and China, which are, of course, have great interests in the situation and in the region? I don't know if perhaps Switzerland could play that role or the United Nations or even currently we have the Swedish and Swiss troops at the DMZ, the Neutral uh, Nation Supervisory Commission. I don't know to what extent these kind of neutral entities could play a certain role. Can I answer um, that or... Yeah, sorry. Um, um... Well, again, this is where my uh, pessimistic side kicks in. I mean, Pascal mentioned quite, you know, figuratively that, you know, we are still in a realist era. So as much as I think that we cannot discount the role of so-called smaller states like Sweden and et cetera, I think we need some input from major powers. I mean, like EU could be good one, but even individual states like France that maintains good ties with South Korea, but also with uh, China, I mean, not just, and with the US. And as we've seen from recent action from Macron, you know, I mean, he recently visited Beijing and yeah, his, his visit was received controversially, but at least within France, I don't think it caused much rough, you know, it didn't really cause much consternation because of course, this is kind of like the continuation of the Gaulian diplomacy, right? So. I think we need um, third parties like France to step in. And actually, De Gaulle did suggest permanent neutrality to Korea back in the 1960s, I believe. That was, that was rejected. But I think, not now again, but maybe in about two decades or so, uh, where I think the power distribution will shift even further to you know, multipolarity, then I think even Washington may have, have no choice but to say, all right, let's, you know, uh, think something else, then maybe neutrality can, can can be an option. And when that happens, uh, uh, you know, like that can just like in chosen Korea, I think countries like France can play some meaningful role. I may be mistaken, but I'd like to hear what Pascal have to say. Yeah. I, I agree. It would have to be. It would have to come from some major outside player. 
And let's be realistic. The Swiss are too boring and too cowardly to suggest something like that. I'm sorry to say that as a Swiss, but in 200 years, we have never, ever suggested that, uh, you know, on, on an official diplomatic level, we have never pushed like very strongly for, for, for anything, m m maybe with the exception of the Red Cross. But uh, the Swiss diplomacy has a bad track record of trying to, to push for like, you know, like implementing what's good about, about its system. Um, the uh, the neut neutralization of Austria was not proposed by the Swiss. It was the Russian it was the Soviet Union that said Austria should be neutralized according to the Swiss model. And it was the Austrians who signed off on it. And the, the Americans who also said, fine, that's good enough. Uh, let, let's, let's take this. And that's how that one came about. Uh, Turkmenistan was uh, said it by itself. We want to do it ourselves. And I would actually put more hope into um, maybe the Chinese, because they are very, very realistic. And the North Korean regime is, is you know, at the same time a buffer, but also a, a thorn in its in its side. I mean, the North Koreans never behave exactly the way the Chinese want. And they're quite annoying as well. And quite they, uh, they can could be potentially dangerous, right? So the, the Chinese, I believe, would be very susceptible to this kind of thinking. And the other ones that I suggest to look at is the Mongolians. Mongolia has a very good relationship with North Korea because historically a communist uh, brother state, and it has a it has a positive normal relationship with South Korea. So, and Mongolia also declared its neutrality back in two thousand fifteen, more or less. I mean, not 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 as clear cut as, as, as some others, but the Mon Mongolia might be helping. So, I think regional powers could be way more influential in this in this process, if any at all. Maybe the French again as well, because they are there. They also seem to be more re re realistic these days. Though so that's the ones that I would put my uh, my faith in, or would try to approach if I had the means. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if Dr. Kim would you like to add something to that. I would like to try. Um, I am charging my um, phone, Korean phone, for um, per, um, personal hotspot. That's what um, where the juice comes from, but it was um, it lost battery power. So um, the um, um, re different religious um, sects in Korea <clears throat> are pretty much um, are in uh, not in conflict. They unite very quickly because um, um, more base um, in the deeper base of uh, different religions is a deeper spirituality roots from a deeper spirituality that um, goes all the way back to like um, Tangun, Gojoseon, um, 5,000 years ago. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the founding concept of um, Tangun, Joseon, Gojoseon is Hongik Ingan. Uh, and Hongik Ingan is um, the, the foundation of a Korean education, of um, the modern Korean education. Uh, so Hongik Ingan means benefiting the world, widely benefiting the world, which means a self-transcendent way of living that is shared by North Korea and South Korea and the Christians, Catholics, Buddhists, one Buddhist, um, Muslims, all the religious people in South Korea, they share uh, in, the, in, in, the, in that um, founding fundamental spiritual principle of um, um, transcending self-transcendence and living to benefit the world. And actually um, the problem that, that's blocking South Korea to get people on rise or um, learn about it, it is basically lack of information. They are not educated in the importance of neutrality and about how to. So uh, I was going to talk about that, how to get that um, happen. And so I would like to continue saying that um, uh, the, the question, how can we jumpstart? Uh, before that is, um, there are three stages of Korean neutralization and that um, Dr. Kang, who is present in this um, um, webinar, uh, he devised. And uh, number one is popularization of uh, neutralization. Two is politicization. Three is institutionalization. Yeah, we unfortunately lost Dr. Kim again. Um, perhaps you can 
add on to more after when she joins again. But I maybe want to add something that is a little linked to what she mentioned. It's again about the interest and the lack of conscience, contentious, both internally and externally. And you also both mentioned that in your presentations, Dr. Lota and Dr. Jin. And I don't know how in the current context would we see interests being uh, how, how could we find again a consensus and interest in all the so I have um, my powers own that are to that question? Sorry, um, Dr. Kim, we lost you earlier and we went on with I, another question. Am I on? Yes, we can hear you now. Uh, I wanted to add up to what add on to what you were saying. And uh, my question was, how could we find interest in all the actors, yes. both internally and externally? Yes. Oh, we, um, I think there is a way to get in there, and that is um, by mobilizing the inter in, uh, international community, um, like Swiss scholars, uh, like Pascal Lutas and um, uh, Dr. Jin Sang Bill is, uh, is um, Korean, so Korea Korean people um, discount Korean Koreans even if um, they are uh, professors in Denmark. And that, that their voice is not important to them. They have uh, this kind of um, mindset that completely foreign people talking about Korean neutrality, uh, about Korean issues, they pay more attention. Um, it carries more weight. So my suggestion is um, Swiss and Austrian experts could provide supporting articles on Korean neutrality in Korean mainstream newspapers to um, aid the Korean predicament. And the Korean predicament is um, uh, calling neutrality activists as following North Korean path. Um, the North pro-North, but too much pro-North because unification, many unification activists are pro-North, not following the North Korean regime, but they want to embrace both Koreas. But when it comes to neutrality, neutrality activists, they consider neutrality is following Kim Il-sung. And it's, um, um, it's a label that really um, damages their work, their career. So, there are many things um, that Korean uh, neutrality experts um, write and submit to the newspapers, and newspapers don't accept them. <laughs> that is the predicament. So, um, because they are divided between um, pro North and pro um, pro US, so strong, and um, how to get in there to change that or to bring changes is by foreign scholars, especially um, like Switzerland, because Swiss is um, looked up by the Korean people as being an ideal society, the, the country that has accomplished what they would like to have ha happen in, for them in their country. So um, we, the Korean neutrality activists, want to establish a coalition for um, the, the Swiss and Austrian Yes, I think it cut again. Maybe I, I... May, 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 may I add to this? Maybe that, you know, um, Dr. Kim's idea is is actually a good one when we think about, uh, you know, grassroots activism. Um, there are certain things that in academia we can do that other, se that other sectors can. And one of them would be like a people to people relationship. Something quite fantastic, you know, would be if it if it was possible to create a uh, an exchange like this but including one or two scholars from pyongyang university and one or two scholars from seoul university you know because one of the worst things about the current situation is that we don't have any any kind of communication and exchange and we demonize and one of the questions in the chat actually is you know how do we how do we square totalitarianism with like democratic values how do we how do we uh, square the propaganda Interestingly, the question in the chat um, talks about uh, prop northern propaganda. I would also uh, p p um, point 
point to the fact that we also live on the propaganda, right? In in, in the West, so we it's the the question is how do we transcend the propaganda that we ourselves are exposed to? How do we break down all of these stereotypes and 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 start again uh, uh, some form of reconciliation? And unfortunately, the North and the South haven't had a good track record in, in trying to on a political level to get reconciliation done. But we know that on the people level, we know that the Koreans are the same. They speak the same language. They eat the same food. They want to be with each other. Uh, so we how do we make that possible again i don't know if we can because the political situation is so difficult but if it was possible especially through intermediation through people like dr kim etc to connect to connect uh, scholars in in pyongyang with scholars in switzerland and austria and uh, and denmark and create a framework where we could discuss this and hear what people from pyongyang have to say you know and uh, although this might be dangerous for them, but if they were willing to do that, if or if if that was even something that they would want to do, and that maybe even North Korea would want to do, then maybe we would have a way at least to explore the field, um, including them. I think. I think uh, hmm. Yes, please, Doctor Jin. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I think both Doctor Kim and Doctor and Pascal, uh, Doctor Lotus, mentioned very important points and. I agree with Dr. Kim that I may be Korean living in Denmark, working in a relatively well-known institution, but I, I am painfully aware that partially because of personality, but also, you know, environment that my views won't count that much, you know, in South Korea, it's just the reality. I, I was, that's why I think I'm glad that the likes of Pascal is are publishing this kind of materials at the prominent university in Japan. And I was, so I think that uh, I'm sorry that I, maybe I'm giving more burden on Pascal, but I think the, the Pascal has to play more prominent role than me. That's number one. Number two is that I actually met this uh, Korean professor at Columbia University. He was in the uh, uh, working in Korean law, and he was quite conservative, but then he ironically also supported Korean tradition, not because he's pro of Korea, because he isn't. But he and I both agree that all those South Korea security ties with U.S. has been important. But from purely commercial business point of view, you know, losing Chinese market is not on for South Korea. So whether you it's not the issue of okay, are you pro U.S. or pro China? It's more about pra pragmatic, pragmatic stuff, you know. And South Korea, you know, yes, has been you know, doing its own decoupling, I suppose, trying to export more to ASEAN markets in India. But realistically, we are talking perhaps at least two or three decades for South Korea somehow reduce its uh, heavy reliance on China. So I think we need people like this uh, Korean professor who works in in New York and who has some, who may, whose political belief may not be necessarily pro China or pro North Korea, but still recognizes the need of neutrality for practical concerns. And I think we also need to bring on business community because business community, you know, they are pragmatic people. I mean, they will go anywhere in the world, right, to earn money. So it's not really, so they don't really care if uh, whether, you know, China is on the CCP or not, it doesn't really matter. So that's, I think, what we need. Thirdly, I think we need to somehow restore 1.5 track diplomacy where again, people like Pascal can should, should participate, I should say, not can or should, because I think his voices like him will count much more than me. So yeah, that's my modest take on way forward, I suppose, yeah. I uh, just very quickly, very true about the business community, very true. And just for everybody's information, neutrality is first and foremost an economic concept that was that was born out of the maritime maritime environment of seven <laughs> of 700 years ago. And um, and uh, uh, it's exactly as you say, like business people are interested in, in doing business. And neutra if neutrality is the way to make business flow, then maybe that's a that's a place where we can find 
uh, um, people who would support. Um, I, I recall that in the last webinar you did, um, Melanie, there was also an, a Swiss entrepreneur who was working in both South and North, right? And that, that is quite interesting. We need the political framework to to allow for that. Um, but maybe maybe there's 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 leeway that they know that we don't, uh, and we could we could try to use, uh, or that could be trying to be used for to create again people to people ties that would hopefully hopefully lead somewhere. Thank you very much. I think Dr. Kim, you still wanted to share one point. I have um, two things to say. Um, um, Dr. Lotas, Pascal Lotas, I really heard what you said. Um, I will keep what you said in mind. And on my next chance to visit Pyongyang, I will uh, look into a possibility of arranging uh, um, the professor um, uh, Jung Tung-gi, I think. Uh, I, will, he, I, will, I will try. Uh, I would propose uh, that we have a uh, 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 Zoom meeting with um, uh, Swiss, Denmark, and um, Austria um, on new Korean neutrality. Uh, the next, the last point that I wanted to make is um, that um, we, the Korean neutrality activists, would like to invite um, um, Swiss and Austrian scholars on. Um, neutrality to um, be on advisory committee for the International Network for New uh, Neutral Korea. Uh, and this will help uh, establish the institutional International Neutral Peace Institute in Goyang Island. Goyang Island is already, um, I mean, this university idea is already in motion. And Goyang Island is located at the western end of DMZ, overlooking a, a North Korean village. Uh, this is already a neutral zone, free of military weapons. So um, by being on this kind of advisory board uh, committee, uh, you could help advise this peace university, neutral peace university to go to, on, um, on the, to be on the fast track to uh, disseminate the information about new, neutral peace. And uh, uh, it will invite students from all over the world to study neutral peace in that university. So that's um, a very concrete something that um, we are trying to get happen. So once Very happy we to have do that. this kind of organ, then uh, you 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 become um, a person, a known person in the Korean society. So you can um, contribute Swiss your um, um, ideas to the Korean society. Uh, the kind of things that uh, Korean scholars are not allowed to write about. Mm -hmm. I very much applaud your 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 activism and and your your um, your dedication to this. I'm very happy to join uh, what you're doing. Thank you very much to all the panelists. I'm very sorry that we have to end the discussion here. It's already 11:30, and I I would have so many more questions and things to talk about, but. We'll have to end it here. Uh, but before we end this webinar, um, I would like to still invite Dr. Katsumi Otsuka, Chair of UPF Europe and the Middle East, to give concluding remarks. So please, Dr. Katsumi Otsuka. Thank you very much, Melanie. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'd like to send my deep respect to all the panelists for your investment and the dedicated study on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you very much. Let me speak a little bit about the Korean Peninsula in the peaceful unification of the peninsula as a closing remarks. Many uh, measures or the ways for the unification of the Korean Peninsula have been discussed since that uh, North, North and South Division was fixed in, in 1953. We, however, had, had, have had no so-called concrete or uh, acceptable, acceptable measures for both sides up to the present. Furthermore, the domestic and the international environment which surrounds the Korean Peninsula have greatly changed. I think, therefore, now is the time to find out the effective and the creative way for the peaceful unification of the Korean Peninsula. 
I believe that we need a new inspiration, new idea or a new view to the peninsula. Let me, that is why I'd like to speak a little bit about the Sonia Yun, the South Korean president, visit, state visit to the United States of America. And then I, I'd like to say something about Rose Azanan, closing remarks. The South Korean president, Sonia Yun, with his wife visited the United States of America this April. Their visit was very meaningful for both nations and attracted world media attention. As it, as it marked the 70th anniversary of the armistice agreement on the Korean Peninsula, the Korean War. The summit, this summit meeting will remember in the opinion, in my opinion, as a turning point of the bilateral relationship between US and Korea. They agreed the Washington Declaration and they announced on April 26, the so-called Washington Declaration. They sent out a very strong message uh, to North Korea. If the North Korea attacked the South Korea or launched as a nuclear missiles, USA op openly declared they will take another stronger countermeasures for North Korean provocation and some others. The Washington Declaration has a foreign implication in my opinion. The US and the South Korean alliance was upgraded from Korean, Korean security to uh, the Indo-Pacific security. The contingency in the peninsula is the crisis on the big threat or the big threat to the stability of the Indo-China, Indo-Pacific areas. Currently, the biggest threat to, the South, to South Korea is the North Koreans' nuclear missile and other, other offensive weapons they have. Since nobody can imagine that polar new North Korea will absorb the richer South Korea peacefully, some scholars say that the measure for the unification left for the North Korea is just a unification by force. Accordingly, the current concern for the South Korean government may not be the unification, but the national defense. The US tried to wipe out the distrust among the Asian people issuing this Washington Declaration. The agreement has helped the US government to dispel the South Korean people's distrust to the United States of America, which emerged when the US troops withdrew from Afghanistan. President Biden strongly stressed the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, that is good, which means to, to stop any attempt to develop nuclear weapons in South Korea. For your reference, the survey in South Korea shows that the three quarters of the population support the development of the nuclear weapons. As you know well, uh, the economic and, indust and industrial, uh, industrial conflict between US and China is at its peak. In particular, the war over semiconductors is the biggest biggest conflict between US and China. Without joining in the US, Japan, and Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing ally alliance, South Korea's future economic development cannot be expected in this field. South Korea's national strategy, economy with China, and the national security with US is shifting to security and economy with the United States of America. With regard to the peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula, it is affirmed that the cooperation between the South Korea, Japan, and the US is essential matter, which was strongly pointed out by the UK founders a long time ago. The North Korean Supreme Leader looks like just focusing on the maintaining and the protecting the nation, his regime, at any cost of the people, than unification of the Korean Peninsula. South Korea also, their concern is no, uh, national security, as I spoke, not to allow North Korea to attack them. The current president of foreign policy in this regard is well received by the public. The greatest challenge for the unification is the uh, declining South Korean people's concern to it. South Korean people has lost almost all this kind of the strong feeling or the zeal to seek for the reunification. 
they have learned from the German reunification about the cost of the reunification, which would depress the Korean economy. And the economic gap between North and South is 50 times more than that of East and, South, uh, East and West Germany. That is why the South Korean people, I just came back from South Korea, is feeling that they will be mobilized to, to bear on the extremely heavy unification cost. That is why the international cooperation is particularly necessary for the for support of the Korean reunification, particularly from Japan. Japan have to support more. That's my, my opinion. Taking all these into my account, I can share with you the following uh, proposal or uh, ideas at this moment together with you. South Korea's public opinion towards the unification must be upgraded beyond the conflict between conservatives and liberals. The old fashioned way of unification does not work out anymore. UPF founder delivered a lot of new views to the peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula. I would like to encourage you to check it, to take a look at the, our founders' way of reunification. It is also necessary to establish that the wide range of cooperation in the international community. As Pascal said, that the emergence of the military, past, uh, emergence of the strong military powerful state in the Korean Peninsula will pose a major threat to neighboring countries such as China, Russia, and Japan. That is why they have to spoke, they have to speak, or they have to announce to the to the world that uh, new uh, that uh, the unified Korea will never be, never never attack other foreign neighboring countries. This kind of the guarantee have to be made by both countries. Otherwise, Korean Peninsula reunification is it will never be realized. Number three, the, the third point I'd like to share with you is the establishment of the peace zone on the Korean Peninsula or as in the 38 powers, uh, Korean Peninsula 38 powers will attract many people's concern. We once uh, they proposed to make a kind of the peace zone in the 38 parallel areas, attracting UN office there. That have to be taken care of the UN and have to be taken care of by the international community for a while for the peaceful reunification. No student, no Korean student and businessman, you said, are very much concerned about the foreign countries. That is why I strongly wish to recommend use and the student exchange between North and South will be very effective for the peaceful reunification, reunification of the Korean Peninsula. UPF founder once stressed the importance of the exchange between young peoples of North and South. I'd like to, I'd like to, uh, the, I'd like to the propose to organize that the student, student and the young generation exchange between South and North, North and South, inviting some other neighboring country young peoples together in Pyongyang or in the 38 parallels in, in Seoul, whatever, that kind of the activity have to be made. In this regard, the UPF sent our delegation from Russia to Pyongyang for organizing the peace road Pyongyang. We did it. And we are planning to have another exchange program in the city of Pyongyang this year too. This will help that the both countries for the unification. These, these are the kind of the proposal from the UPF. We will, we will work on it. And with all your support, we truly wish to realize peaceful unification of the Korean Peninsula, including the neutralization of the Korean Peninsula. Thank you very much. May, may God bless us all. Thank you very much. No Mr. problem. <laughs> Thank you for your closing remarks and also sharing what UPF has done and many suggestions and activities that could be held in the future.
Before I close this webinar, I would like to inform you all that in mid-June, a Swiss tour is taking place, organized by Vanna Kim Hansen and also her council, and it will take place to better understand Swiss neutrality and neutrality in general, and also its potential application to the Korean Peninsula. And in case you are interested to join, please contact us and we'll get you in touch with Dr. Kim Hansen. I want to particularly thank our panelists and experts, Dr. Kim Hansen, Dr. Jin, Dr. Lota, and also Dr. Otska, uh, for their contribution and very for their very interesting uh, discussion and the precious food for thought. And thank you also to all our participants who have shown interest in the topic. And a big thank also to all the staff, to, to Mr. Yamazaki for coordinating this association and for making this webinar possible. Um, to end this webinar, could I ask all the panelists and staff to appear on the screen so we may take a final group picture, if that would be possible in gallery view. Yes, is the technique ready? Okay, one, two, three, let's take a picture, smile. One more, maybe we can also wave. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed this webinar as much as I did. Let us really do our best to develop ideas and research further for peace and security. And also, please take very well care of yourselves. And I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank again. you. Bye. Thank you.